for as long as I can remember, I thought of myself as an artist. I consciously said that in kindergarten, I know that. And that was the first time I was really exposed to paint. So <laughs> whenever the paint came out, I was all over it, and I would, that's all I wanted to do. Right now, I'm very excited about my new series I'm calling Root Bound. And it's all about imagery of trees, and I'm using trees as a metaphor for human connection. I think about roots as a symbol for our ancestors. The way trees communicate with each other and depend on each other for survival, I think that's a really interesting comparison with human relationships. When I'm in my studio, it gives me a feeling of peace and that alone time is something I always crave, so I just make time for it. There have been times in my life where I just don't get to it, and it's something that's always on the back of my mind, thinking of what kind of projects I would like to do when I have the time, and I don't know, it's just something that I can't really describe, that I have to do it. process involves walking and meditating and then drawing and sketching and then painting. So it's kind of a cycle and when I say meditating I don't mean just really formally sitting down like this and meditating. <laughs> it's more like um, I let my mind wander, I let myself think as I walk about what is my next painting going to look like and what I would like to accomplish. And I also always find inspiration with nature. Spending the last 14 years teaching art at a public high school has inspired me in a lot of different ways because I'm at a science and math school and I love using science concepts in my work, especially when I was commissioned to do a mural about plankton for the zoo. I learned a lot about plankton and I really enjoyed painting that. And my students inspire me a lot every day because they're so, they're so funny and they're so young and they're, they're so um, inventive. <laughs> and I'm very excited about this project that I'm going to do this summer with youth because I was the recipient of the Tacoma Artist Initiative Project Grant. I'm going to bring together 16 students from various Tacoma high schools, and I asked for students who were LGBTQ plus and their allies who were really passionate about art, and we're going to get together for a week in August to do a workshop, and we'll all be painting our own self-portraits and my hope is that we'll have a community, a new community of young artists um, who get to meet each other and inspire each other. And then we're going to show our work at a big public exhibition in October. I am very grateful for that opportunity because it's just kind of pushing me in this new direction of working with students who are really committed and I love working with students every day in my public high school, but I know that they're not all going to be artists. I know that learning some art skills is very important and it's going to help them in whatever they want to do. I feel like one of the major things anyone gets from drawing is learning to observe and learning to see and see really deeply and I think those powers of observation will help anyone in any job that they want to do, whether it's an engineer or a doctor or anyone. If you can really observe and see the world isn't just black and white, it's like all of those beautiful shades of gray that are in between the black and white, um, and that makes you a whole person and it makes you better rounded. and more able to understand others and where they're coming from. And I think it all, it all stems back to 
your own powers of observation. This summer, I am going to paint a mural on 6th Avenue, and it's funded by the SpaceWorks mural program. I'm excited about the design that I came up with. It's an octopus tattooed onto an arm, and the fist is like this, and the fist is holding a bouquet of dandelions, which I think are a great symbol for just your average flower that's very beautiful, and they grow everywhere. I feel like it's a nice symbol for Tacoma. I feel like I've realized more and more the older I get that um, having a community of artists is really important to me and having friends that are also going through the struggles of putting their art out there, it's just really important to be able to have those friends to talk to. When I am painting, I usually like to be alone, but every time I've painted a large mural, I have my friend Joni help me or my friend Will, or any number of people who've offered to just be there and help put it together. I just love collaborating with other people on ideas for public art projects. I don't collaborate so much with what's going on in my own studio, but it's nice to have both going in my life. For a long time, I wasn't able to just make the time to paint for whatever I wanted. And a studio practice, I feel like, is pretty new to me. And uh, I'm really excited about, you know, going forward with it and seeing where it takes me. Put it out there and just keep creating. The best advice I would like to give to young artists or, or old artists even, <laughs> or people that want to try art that have told themselves they're not going to be good at it is um, just just try it and um, keep persevering and it's always okay to make art that you never show to anyone and once I tell my students that the ones who are really afraid to draw I tell them draw at home when no one's around and then throw it away and they go yeah that kind of blows their mind and I say because the more you do that, the better you get at it. And just keep doing it because everyone can learn to be good at it. And who's to say you're not good at it or, um, or judge whether or not it should happen. But I think it is, it's good for your soul to get your art out there. If you listen to the news for five minutes, things don't sound so good. But in programs like this all over the country, things are good. And that's why we come together and do this work. In the community at the time when TBB was founded, Pierce County was part of a really interesting project. It started out as the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. So Pierce County Juvenile Court and the Annie E. Casey Foundation were working together to try to stop incarcerating so many young people, to understand how to prevent them from ever entering into the system, and then once they do, to give them opportunities to get them back out as fast as possible. So imagine, you know, a highway with more exit ramps. And so there was this need in the community at that time for those exit ramps and exit ramps can be a lot of things. It can be services. It can just be lower sentences for things. It turns out, for example, just picking up a phone and throwing it across the room, if it happens to get destroyed, it's an extremely valuable piece of technology, and all of a sudden you go from somebody pitching a fit to somebody on a felony offense because of the value of the phone. Instead of dealing with the whatever it is that's happening in that moment that causes that event to happen, we're punishing them. And so the leadership of the court was looking for alternatives to punishment that were more like opportunities. And TBB was formed to serve that population, to work with the court 
on creating spaces where young people could come who were struggling in different ways and find ways to serve them and, and help them find a spot in the community. Many people walk in, they've never been in a wood shop or never worked around boats or anything like that whatsoever. It's, it's not what we're here to do. What we're here is just to give people a safe space just to be. There's a lot of things I've learned here, like that there's always going to be a welcoming home for you to understand your place in life. There was this one time that I was kind of struggling with a couple of things, like a little bit of my past. They kind of helped me and welcomed me in with open arms, thinking you're not a bad person, so you're always welcome here and to learn and love yourself. We've kind of turned from just a experiential hands-on program where kids could come in and get their hands on tools and, and learn things about building things to kind of a, I'm going to call it a social justice program. As I'm sure everybody's aware, our community is facing a lot of different things in regards to youth violence, youth crime. If it wasn't for places like this, it would be a lot crazier, believe it or not, than it is now. And so being able to bring those youth in and surrounding them with positive people is something that can break cycles within the community. Even if you reach just one youth, that's one youth that's off the streets, you know, ruining their life and ruining other people's lives as well. It's a very civilized way for people to learn, for people to get together. So we've got a room full of people, and pretty quickly the energy starts to elevate. And then we'll have our opening circle, and people share a few things about themselves, how they're feeling. And then the work starts. Every once in a while, I'll lift my head and look around, and you just see sawdust flying and the tools going, and people standing together at a bench with their heads down. It's a flow. It's the zone, you know, it's, that's what we're looking for. That's what I've always looked for in my work is, where is that place where you lose yourself in the work? And quite often, you can look around the room and see everybody's lost themselves in the work. Youth engagement specialist means a lot of different things. It means being a friend. It means being a phone call if you need any help. It means hanging out. It means going out to eat. Ultimately, it just means being a healthy adult mentor to those that are willing, just through sincere conversation. I'm able to show those that I work with that, you know, I'm truly there for them and it's not just a paycheck type of thing. The way we encourage our youth, we just listen. We don't, we don't ever want to tell a youth what they should do or what they should be doing. We more so give youth autonomy. I think that's something that they don't get in an everyday world. I personally like the checkups because it's like not many people ask how I'm doing when I'm kind of struggling and stuff and if I am struggling they'll ask me if I'm okay and that kind of lets you know that you're safe around everyone here and that you can be trusted and people can trust you. You're not really alone. There's a lot of people that really don't know where they need to start off but there's always people to help you and eventually when you leave here in eight weeks you'll kind of get a grasp on how fun it was and how enjoyable your time here was. With wood, you have to meet it on its own terms. You have to understand it. You can bend it, but you can't just make it bend. You kind of have to ask it to, and you have to treat it in the right way. If you get it right, right, all around us, you can see them. These artifacts will take you somewhere. 
that's one thing that you got to remember. Youth are just adults going through childhood. They have this small fraction of their life where they'll spend as a young person. And then the rest of their life, they're an adult. So you got to kind of approach it in that way. No, you don't want to be outright firm to them as you would another adult, but you do want to give them that respect that one day, pretty soon, you're going to make a lot of decisions on your own and you're going to think for yourself. And I just want to give you the tools that may help you to form the way you think or the, the way you move in life, right? But we give them that choice. We don't make it for them. Since I've learned how to draw a little bit here, I've thought of the idea of like, kind of after I go to college for carpentry, I want to like kind of learn how to draw a little bit more, take my aspirations for drawing a little bit more serious. When young people leave our program, we continue on if that is what they choose. We continue to try to have that relationship with them because we realize that you can't make the impact that you want within a matter of weeks. Everything takes time. So we, we build lasting relationships with them. And for youth to walk in and be like, damn, this place, this, these people are cool and this thing is weird, but I'm gonna give it a shot. They'll come back. They'll come back years later and ask how their mentor is, or how Chuck is, or where's the dog, because we've always had a dog. You know, they know they can come back. I probably learned more from the kids and the students that I've worked with over my lifetime than they learned from me. In fact, I'm pretty positive. Everything I know about boat building, I learned from my students. <laughs> this warm, peaceful, inviting feeling. The effects of a sound bath can be really, really powerful, or any sound therapy session. The name of my studio is Johnny Girl Sound Therapy and Healing Art Studio. I'm located in the Henry Drum House in the Stadium District, and I offer several modalities of sound therapy, including sound baths, vibrational sound therapy, which is bowls on the body, tuning fork therapy called inner sound, and acutonics, among other things. When I'm doing a sound bath, I am working with several different therapeutic grade instruments. Sometimes I'm putting instruments on the body and activating them. And I'm working in the space with these different instruments, um, brass bowls, quartz bowls, tuning forks, all kinds of gongs. And so I'm basically using these instruments to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to relax and release and recover. I tend to use binaural beads, which is taking two bowls that are tuned a few hertz apart from one another, which allow them to cancel one another out. So I'm usually working with the 440 and another bowl tuned to 432. Those two numbers cancel one another out, and then we tap into 8 hertz, which is going to get you into that theta brainwave state. And so within that brainwave state, we're able to really relax and recover. And then when I'm doing the vibrational sound therapy, I'm using therapeutic grade singing bowls, brass bowls on the body. And in addition to getting the body to relax, I'm also using kind of like brain entrainment with the rhythm of the activation of the bowls to kind of get the mind to slow down. And then people tend to relax. And there's like that spot between when you're fully asleep and when you're like almost falling asleep. And that's where a lot of energetic work and healing is able to be done. So we're able to get out of our minds and fully relax and then release.
But when I found out that Johnny was doing this, I sent her a message and she was so gracious and allowed me to have a session with her. And when I left Johnny's studio, there was just this calmness, this relaxation within me. The stress was gone, the anxiety was gone, and it just helped me to get through my day and allows you to look in the world through different eyes. So, you know, I like to say through eyes of compassion. You know, in our daily lives, we get tossed and turned here and there. We get demands pulled from us left and right. And it allows you to release them and, and figure out how to get to them in a way that is compassionate to you and in a way it's compassionate to the situations at hand too. It's like it's providing that checkup within your body, connecting yourself back to self. What's interesting is the healing arts sound like a nice to have, but I believe that they are a need to have. There's this incredible modality that offers a healing, that offers relaxation, that allows people to just take care of themselves and care for themselves. And when we start talking about self-care, it almost like, I'm a twin mom. I understand it's like self-care. My self-care is being like, I'm gonna take a break and sitting in my car for 10 minutes just so that I don't hear my children. <laughs> like it's not often, like we're starting to learn how to take time for ourselves. And it's just something that I realized that I wanted to encourage, just creating the time, slowing down, taking space, caring for yourself so that you can then care for others. And identifying that need kind of really lit the fire as well on just this is something that needs to be offered to the community. The experience helps people, first of all, gets them to slow down. That's the first thing. And it allows for the opportunity to not think, to not think about all of the things that you need to get done. It allows you to like slow down, turn within, and just release. And the thing is, we tend to hold on to a lot of tension, a lot of stress, a lot of energies that don't serve us. And the beauty of this modality or these modalities is that the bowls, the forks, these healing instruments, they force you to just snap into the space of relaxation and recovery. And that relaxation and recovery is a space that we're able to heal. And so it's just a really important offering, having the experience that allows the client to get out of the way and just allow the healing to commence. To have a client who sets the intention to come into the space and just relax that's incredible to me. To witness that and to have them say, I don't think I've ever been this relaxed in my life. That's just, it's such an honor. And I think I've never been this relaxed in my life is just as important as I healed generational trauma, which is just as important as I haven't slept this well in a long time. I think there's value to all of those experiences. They're all equally important in my opinion. Sound is really healing and it, it goes down deep into our tissues, deeper than we even realize. And I really think it helped me through my process of healing. Mm -hmm.